science and education. Uh, Phil's been recognized by industry as a 2013 IBM Business Analytics Champion and as a member of Adobe's Educational Leaders Group and Adobe's Higher Education Advisory Board. Uh, Phil was also a recipient of the Adobe Higher Education Leaders Impact Award in 2010. Uh, in specific interest here at uh, Penn State, Phil's the primary investigator on a uh, $1 million grant through WCET to explore online retention patterns across six institutions. This is the PAR framework, correct? And that's something that Penn State World Campus is participating in. And I found out today that Phil's also an advisory board member at Civitas Learning, a learning analytics company that Penn State has just uh, agreed to a three-year deal with. So we're really excited to have Phil here to talk about all his work and maybe how to get us off on the right track with uh, data and analytics. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. So a little bit about the presentation. Um, I've got a few slides here, not more than 50 or 60. Um, about that. Okay. Sorry, there will be no death by PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I'm trying to avoid. I just want to try to highlight a small amount of the work that I've been involved with over the years. Um, a lot of my work has spanned analytics. A lot of it, though, is back-end systems infrastructure that makes the analytics possible, that makes the learning environments possible. So I want to highlight a few things that have been significant and then really talk about what I think is coming next. And it's not envisioning things that will happen. It's taking things that actually exist today and how I see them being applied to education and some of the possible pathways. So I want to make this as conversational as possible. If you have any questions at all, just stop me. Uh, and I'm going to bring up, I am going to bring up a few slides here in a moment. You will notice when you bring them up, I'm bringing them up with my consulting company's name on them because the opinions expressed in these slides do not reflect the opinion of American public university systems. <laughs> Uh, so, with that caveat, I, these are some things I've gathered from other areas, and yes, since we are for-profit, I do make that disclosure if I want to say something like this today. So, um, with that said, learning analytics to date. What do learning analytics in the market look like? And whenever I use the word market, I've spent a lot of times around, a lot of my life around industry. So market means higher education, whenever I say it. But to understand the factors related to re uh, retention, and like one of the facts we talked about today at lunch, transfer credits are hugely predictive of success. It's just a point thing we find out. There's tons of other stuff out there. Everybody knows by now what the retention data looks like. and know who the at-risk students are. This has actually became somewhat mundane on identifying the smaller groups. This was largely what PAR was started with. The idea for PAR actually um, came about me and one of the Gates officers um, over cocktails at a conference about five years ago. And then it took two years to get it funded and another year to get the data cookbook together. And by now, everybody knows, you know, you know certain demographic clusters tend to persist. Uh, less than others, you know, you've heard, like I said, you've heard most of this stuff. Things like success in first four courses, these have became universal truths that we start to extract out across universities. Um, and we're starting to see things like benchmarking of national standards rising um, as a prominent theme. Again, PAR being one of those things. Civitas doing it internally with their infrastructure and their capabilities. Um, other standards that may have already existed that people didn't think about as part of an analytics package until recently, NESI, the National Student Survey of Student Engagement. Now all the people are like, hmm, this NESI thing, that's actually analytics, wasn't it? So, yeah. But it's taken it's taking the sector a long time to catch on to what data really means and to be able to wrap their minds around how much data exists in a university and where it's all at. As I understand, you all have a data warehouse. Well, think about that data warehouse, how many places it's being fed by just to get it there. As I say, analyzing the data is the easy part. 90% of the battle is actually getting the data, which that's very relevant to one of the parts I'm going to talk about uh, here in a moment. Uh, use of social process modeling determines satisfaction. Now, this is one of those metrics that's been around for a long while. 
for better or worse, we've all had end of course surveys. Uh, and sometimes it's often for worse, especially when you see an online course that said the lectures were effective because uh, they still do exist in higher ed. But you know, as flawed as our data may be, we have had access to it. We're starting to understand how to get things together. And as everybody here probably knows, the track record is some of, uh, is getting more and more complete. We've used it for informing instructional design. I've had the pleasure over the years of knowing several of the instructional designers that work at one place or the other associated with Penn State. So I know the value that you all put on data over the years in helping inform instructional design. We're starting to see some other cool stuff. And one of the things I've worked with in the past is we started with the simple regression analysis, decision tree analysis, those type of things to look at retention progression. And as the modeling's got more complex, so are the techniques. At APUS, one of the ones we use that's most effective is we have a massive neural network model that refreshes itself and rebuilds itself every single night. And it runs 187 data points per student. It can tell you who is, who's at the highest likelihood to disenroll from the university in the next five days with a 92% degree of accuracy clipped into the model. Um, and yes, to answer everybody's question before anybody asks it, it's highly invasive in the amount of data <laughs> we collect on students to figure that out. Um, um, then the problem is it tells you who's going to drop out and may tell you what some of the data says and what the correlations are, but it doesn't help with causality. So we've developed a lot over the years at APUS and have helped other institutions do it too, address their text analytics. And that's taking the, quantitative, the qualitative data and breaking it down using keyword indexes. Same thing you would see, like we'll index a lot of student, uh, we started out doing this with just using like a standard leucine backbone to index um, student responses to surveys on. We treated them just like a web page and then indexed them using leucine, which was pretty cool. It's a very efficient way to get a text data. And then we'd also use things like text modeling from IBM that hooked onto their modeler implementation. So, <clears throat> The reason I'm talking about this is just giving you the backdrop of, of where the market's been. And as they mentioned earlier, the power framework seemed to be one of the culminations of this. And the reason I went through this so fast, too, is because it's kind of scary uh, when you think about what's going on with analytics. And five years ago, I was at a work, I, me and two colleagues, did a workshop in San Jose at the Sloan C Emerging Tech Conference. It was on learning analytics. Anybody want to tell you guess how many people there were in the room, aside the presenters? <laughs> aside from the one at lunch? <laughs> and, there was, and there was two other people. If you remember, there was three people in the room <laughs> when we first did the thing. The next year, there was 15. The next year, there was 50-some. The next year, it turned into a full panel discussion. Now, everybody, Everybody at every university, when they talk about analytics, it's, yeah, we got some of those. Uh, and it's considered ubiquitous now. But the problem is that it's almost comical because people believe that the battle's done. We know how to get the data. We know how to analyze it. We're good to go. Well, you know, the problem I see coming is Data-driven decision-making is really limited by the amount of data that we have available for analysis. And as I was, uh, again, relaying over lunch, I've been working on a project um, as a consultant with a university that's using their supercomputer cluster to build a data warehouse on. And I started talking to the guys in the supercomputing department about big data for education. And it actually turned out from their perspective, to be nano data for education. Um, because they, one of the things that that supercomputing cluster does is run the worldwide input from radio telescopes overnight. And the sheer amount of data that's generated off those kind of things is staggering compared to what we generate. Um, content, uh, is not, um, content is not adequately addressed in the current models. And black holes exist in server logs. 
I want to say black holes are, exist in server logs. This is one of the key things I see as being important to the next generation of data. Anytime you have a log event that occurs, anytime you get data, uh, data out of your uh, angels are primary elements right now, right? Okay. The data that comes out of angel is primarily log event data. And that only registers a log event in a server when a student does, performs an action that actually creates an imp that creates an imprint. That, um, sorry for the IT people who are in here. Sorry about the way I'm explaining this, but it creates an imprint basically in the log. It says this action was performed. Um, problem is that there's a whole lot that goes on between any two log events. Because as a, if a student goes to a page that has a video player on it, in addition to other content, you would potentially see three log events associated with it, depending upon how good the table structure is. One, when they went to the page. One, when they left the page. And one, when they activated the video player. What about all the other data that may exist on that page? What about any text-based asset that was on there? What about any static images that existed on that page? We have no idea what the student did on that page except enter, exit it, and hit the video player button, perhaps. So everything that's in there as a gap is what I consider a black hole. And this is a huge amount of transactional data that we need to understand what is going on with. We also have qualitative data that exists that we need to get beyond keyword searching. We need to get into more robust methods for analyzing. So what I'm going to talk about really is not what's been done, but how we take care of these needs. And I'm not going to dwell on this slide. I'll make this deck available to anybody who wants it. But this is really just some of the things that I see that we have to worry about. We need, we need to be able to collect, analyze. We need to have de demonstrations of efficacy. We need to think about personalization of content. What does it mean to use data to personalize content for students? We need to be able to link the interventions back to the data to real life or real time intervention. And we need more dashboarding. And again, I'm not trying to use a buzzword here, but dashboards, which you see now as part of every presentation, every conference you go to. Um, we do need to make the data visible to the stakeholders. That's the students and the instructors both. And this curve really looks at how data is treated. Now, measuring, executing, automating, extending, and optimizing. Right now, the vast majority of institutions out there probably 95% of institutions in the U.S. are at measuring. 5% are executed, or maybe 4.999%. There are a handful who are playing with automation. Nobody's any further up on the curve than this. Now, this is where I've been in academia most of my life. This is why I always like to make people from academia very upset. You know where this curve came from? Anybody want to guess? Business. Marketing analytics. <laughs> it's marketing analytics. It's the formula that's used for marketing. Um, and how you take data about a consumer to drive purchasing cycles. Now, the reason that I use this to talk about students and learning and data. Because there's one very important reason, because one of the elements that I'm going to touch momentarily deals with personalization. And here's one of those points where if anybody feels like they need to interrupt me, please do, because I'm sure somebody may. But when you go online and you go to like an Amazon, there's a tremendous amount of data that they already have about you, from where you came in at, the cookie that's attached to your browser, as well as your purchasing history. And when you see a page in Amazon, 
you're seeing a page that's different than what anybody else in this room would see that helps drive you towards a point of sale. Well, one thing marketing has done, especially with web marketing over the years, and it was done with print marketing for years before that, was the concept of marketing campaigns. The marketing campaign is a selection of content optimized for a certain demographic that will create the maximum possible likelihood that they will execute a purchase. <clears throat> Mathematically. Mathematically, that is exactly the same as providing optimized content to achieve a given learning outcome. There's no difference mathematically between a marketing campaign to drive a point of sale and thinking about how optimizing content to provide an optimized learning experience works. Same thing. So, this model is the basis of driving marketing campaigns. And I think it's how we need to start thinking about our students. And a good example of you're just like, well, okay, but marketers don't know everything about their products that we know about our students. Do you know how much data? I said earlier, whenever we have 187 data points that we put into our neural models, do you know how many data points Walmart has attached to a box of cereal? 900 data points on average for every product in Walmart. They collect about each and every product from the point of origin to the contents, et cetera, et cetera, that they use to work with the marketing on. 900 points per product. Web analytics in the data ecosystem. And this is where I think the next big thing coming is web analytics. We have the event logs coming off servers in the LMS. We have our databases from our ERPs, your SIS, what have you, that consolidates all the demographic and information about students, all the institutional touch points, etc. But when we go to that page, what I was talking about, student coming in here, leaving here, maybe hitting the video player, what happens if they move their mouse up and down on the page? You don't know where their mouse is moving. And why are they moving a mouse? Because even students who have never dealt with a newspaper, read on the web the same way that we read. They scroll and the mouse moves with where they're reading. So it's the same as we might have done tracking down a newspaper. If you're watching someone read a newspaper and they went to a paragraph on a newspaper, stop, went back, stop, went back, what would you infer? That there was something either of high interest in that paragraph they kept reading or it was written so abysmally poorly that they couldn't figure out what it was saying. And if they were given a test, though, on the content, and they did very poorly on the test, and you can see where they were doing this, reading a paper, you would probably think that there was a problem with that paragraph, especially if the content related to it, they were doing this on. But if it's something that they expounded upon in an essay that was related to that same paragraph, then you, know, you think it might have been a very good piece of content. Correlations exist. You don't know until you get into more data. Same here. Web analytics is the part that fills in the holes on the server logs. And it can be used to help everything you see here. Uh, help with retention, progression, mastery, targeting, adaptive. This is where the future is coming. Because this is how Google, how Amazon, how others sort out what you're doing to sell you a product. We just have not successfully done it with education yet uh, at scale. There are a few initiatives where we're trying to insert it into classes. And what's required? It's inserting a little bit of JavaScript into the header of a page. Track. It's also vastly more complicated than that, too. Um, <laughs> that inserting that little bit of JavaScript actually turns into a huge Herculean effort because you have to build data frameworks around all that JavaScript and then reconcile it and then merge it in with the LMS data and the SIS data. But this is done on a daily basis on virtually any commercial site you visit. And there are products that you may have even heard of that are commonplace like Google Analytics, which is the run-of-the-mill mundane. 
Then there's some stuff like I'm going to show you that's exponentially more powerful than that, that is fun to use. So I just told you everything that I was talking about there on the next slide. Um, other data points that we can think about merging up with web analytics, latent semantics, which is natural language extraction. I'm going to show you this in a moment. Um, perceptual data, we talked about behavioral measures, psychometrics, or intercourse survey, etc. So these are some of the data points that are missing from the stack. Behavioral and perceptual, we usually have in our stack, they may be flawed because of bad item design. Latent semantics is the next big one. And I'm going to come to web analytics and show you some examples, but I thought it put in context, I want to show you this first. And I cut this slide up intentionally. Okay, you have an objective here. Employ and demonstrate the application of key accounting theories, blah, blah, blah. Okay, resource title, principles of finance, PowerPoint. Next one, examine and provide examples of the role of accounting in business. This object is no longer fulfilled. What you're seeing here is the actual feedback from a working latent semantic engine that we've started using at APUS that you can take and ingest all the course content from across any course and it doesn't do keyword searches. It actually breaks natural language down in to completely binary structures and then does binary associations between words, sentences, phrases, and paragraphs to map out natural language as a, as a deprecated binary form. Then it compares it. This goal or objective also has a binary <coughs> association with it and it looks for the closest fit between the goal and objective's binary and then the binary is associated with the natural language deconstruction. We broke down every, school, every single course in the College of Business at APUS to do for ACB. And it's the other one, okay. ACBSP, okay. there we go, accreditation. Um, we broke down every single course, semantically analyzed it, and this is the output from it that you're actually seeing. So we knew which assets met which goal, where we didn't have assets where you need to plug them in, and mapping the entire content stack for an entire school of business uh, took about 200 hours using this. That's it. But what were the requirements from the faculty? in terms of um, the way they structured their course. As in? Well, is all of this information in the syllabus? What's in the syllabus? The syllabus has the goals and objectives in it. Okay. Then the course content are the other items and assignments and discussion questions they created. Okay. And we don't need the faculty to structure it any given way. This is basically a JCR-based repository, an open JCR repository where we just sucked all the content out of the LMS into this repository and then it uses latent semantic overrun and a Perl stack overflow on the back of it. Um, and it crunched all the data. So we just pulled it out, did some random samples, 200 and some hours is completely done. The last one of those accreditations I was involved with was before a APUS I was at UNC and then before I had WVU and one of those two schools, I won't say which one. We did the NK accreditation. And in a room about twice this size, there were three earring binders laid out on all the tables, and people would walk around and put a page in each one of them because each notebook matched a goal or objective. So that's the way you sorted content. It took over 8,000 human hours to prepare for NK accreditation. The equivalent on human mapping to business school would have been 3,200 hours, given the pace it took them to work on a half a course that we use for blind comparison. We reduced it down by over 95% on the time requirement and in the process saved roughly a half million dollars. How did it do? It, we used, we used uh, I, I fell back on using qualitative methodology to take a look at it and using a Kappen's Coa, Cohen's Kappa, sorry, Cohen's Kappa comparison of human coders. Two human coders, when looking at the school business content, and these were experts in the field, uh, had a 0.93 on their uh, percent of agreement, which is darn good. Yeah. A human versus the latent semantic engine had a 0.92. Okay. 
So it's only 1% different than a human being. And I was like, being completely untrained. Now that we have this thing really fired up and fed it, now we actually just, we're actually now just starting to feed it stuff out of the Library of Congress just to try to keep making it smarter and smarter. Because the more you feed it, the smarter it gets. So we're just dumping everything into it we can find and aligning it right now. Um, but it's a JCR repository. It has uh, uh, the scene backbone with a solar overlay on it. Then it also runs uh, what's called Dirichlet analysis is the type of semantics we're using. And it's pretty darn fish. So this is the next step, yes. So what sort of reaction? So I've, I've been part of the middle states for accreditation here, and I'm just wondering how did the accrediting body react when you said you were going to use this method to fulfill part of the accrediting body's requirements? We didn't tell them. This is one of those cases. <laughs> this is one of those cases where I've actually put my job on the line, which I've done several times. I just convinced the people that it's the right thing to do. I was like, if it doesn't work, you can fire me. Uh, and this is one of those cases. I said, I know this will work. Well, we don't know. Then blame it on me, and you'll get a second chance if you fire me. So we did that. And the accreditors from ACBSP came in, and they had this kind of a screen that they were pulling up to look at every single course and every single objective. They had allocated two whole days for them to look at all the alignment stuff. In less than three hours, they were completely done and in awe and incredibly happy. Uh, I privately had people from some of the accrediting bodies, the big regionals, tell me that they're waiting for somebody to do this across the whole institution or regional. Yeah, I mean, your middle states took thousands of hours, right? I mean, thousands upon thousands of hours. So, yeah. I said they'd be thrilled if somebody <laughs> would do this. So, but we aren't up for accreditation for another eight years, so it's going to be a problem. But there's a couple of people actually looking at this to think about doing it. The time savings would be huge. Now, that said, it's also built on an open source framework. And um, it's actually under Apache 2 license on the source board. But believe me, it's called Common Libraries, the underlying engine. Even though it's on source board, it's far from free. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you better have some like hardcore Node.js people around to even think about making this work uh, to get it set up and going. Because um, it's, but once you do, it's good. Then it runs really smooth. Um, so one of the things we're doing is, too, once you get all this in here, this allows us to map all the content into true binary form. So binaries can then feed into the statistical models that we're using as dummy binary variables representing the degree of fit of the content. The other thing that's not showing in here that we do now is here it says resource title principles of finance and the PowerPoint that it fits this goal or objective. We've also refined it to now where we have a goodness of fit model. They'll tell you what the percent relative match is on it. So they'll say this matches this objective with a 72% degree of fit. And then what we're working on now is, are you, are you all familiar with the DQP standards uh, from Lumina that they're trying to advocate the degree qualification profile standards? It's a large overarching, there's about 200 schools nationwide involved with this. And it's looking at uniform standards. Nobody wants to say it's like common core, but yes, that's what it is. And it's a really good construct. So one of the things we're doing is we're analyzing every single course at APUS with semantics and then applying them back to the DQP standards. But we're also starting to play with ingesting students' work products and looking at the students' work product and look at the degree of goodness of fit between the students' work product and the goal or objective, so you're automating the entire grading process using latent semantics. Um, and then you can also form maps showing how well the students have met the DQP plus standards. So that's a, now we're not doing that on a wide scale. That's purely black box skunk work stuff that is not going to, you know, be out in the press for a long time because that's you now sat at an academic conference. And that's when they show up with the pitchforks and torches outside your hotel room later that night. So uh, we're not going to do that. Now, I can come back to the web analytics to think, because now we have a really quantifiable measure when you think about content. In. Here's one of the coolest things coming out of web analytics. And this is actual, 
this is actual data that came back from a black box that we're running. It shows pathing diagrams. So what you see in each of these color bands are where the percentage of students in a course went within a course and the steps that they took to get to the ancillary pages in there in a given 24-hour period, where they abandoned, where they fell off, and where they went back on another pathway. So you can see in detail where the students have navigated within a course from a page-to-page -page basis. This is cool. Um, here is another. Remember the question I was asking you earlier? How do you know what happened between when the student clicked on the videos, there you go. That's the heat map diagram that's coming off of a history course. Um, we're using mouse cursor for this? We're using mouse cursor capture. Yep. And, and the heat map is being produced on the hot, on the stick, slick and sticky areas. Now I've said really so because now I comes out slicky and uh, slicky areas. <laughs> but the sticky and slick areas and the cursor movements are all captured on this heat map, uh, with the epicenters being noted and with the fall-off patterns outside of it. So from an instructional design perspective, you can see exactly what students either individually or in aggregate did. Or you can also quantify the behaviors on the heat map done into percentile rankings on the pages and the percent of pay and the percent of hits on it. What are the implications for that technique for devices that don't use mouse input. We can also measure swipe gestures. Okay. But but is the principle the same like a swipe gesture tracks of roughly where it's where you're going, going and it's where you've scanned through. But then if you notice too like if you're doing a swipe gesture and you want to stop it, you have to put your finger in a certain place to stop a to stop a rapid swipe right. gesture. So I mean it's take it takes more time to figure out but you can do the same thing. You can measure swipe gestures using the same thing. And you can also capture voice commands if you're using voice activation. Or even eye movement because it's exploiting the API. So you just we insert JavaScript that's mining into the APIs um, to do that too. So for we seem quite ahead of um, the use of this kind of information. Can you talk a little bit about the use of the data? You because you, you just you seem like you're light years away from, um, unless I'm wrong, an opportunity to use that. Oh, we're not away. From, we're not that far away. And let me go back here. Sorry. Okay. So where we're at is this kind of data that I'm showing moves us from here through the automation up to the extension and optimization on the curve. Once we have all this data collected, we have enough data. Automate entire processes because whenever you're looking at the at the semantic data, we cannot just crunch what we have in our universe. We can also crunch whole uh, index searches that exist at night. One of the things we're doing is building spiders, and I'm not doing this to APUS. I'm doing it to a private group for just for fun in our spare time. We're building something soon to be patented, um, which sends spiders out at night and crawls educational sites and brings back all the mirrors from the educational sites, all the OER sources in the world were mining, and putting them up on a solar index and then exposing them to LSA. So we'll have every single OER map using latent semantics. And then you can assign binaries to it. And once you see how people operate on a site, and if they're avoiding certain types of media, then this will look for the something that covers the same context we use as another media type and provision it to that student on the fly by reaching back through the web analytics and treating it as a campaign. So that's one of the things we're doing using a suggestion engine. Or if you and I have the same assignment that comes up, but you have a different profile than I do, then just like on a news article that you would get online from CNN or whatever, where at the bottom it says, here's other articles that may interest you, 
Those are different for everybody in here, by the way. They're not the same because there are searches out there <coughs> that are being applied that uh, they're. Um, There's, I can't remember what, there's a name for exactly what the search is. But at any rate, it searches out alternative material that is of the same conceptual type, but for different user variations. And it sorts those, and those other resources or articles you get suggest that. So if you combine all this data we're collecting on the way people use the interface, on the behavioral and transactional data, with the other, with the other parts coming out of the latent semantics, and also these indexing tools were, let's just put it this way, it, and even working in a for-profit, we don't have this kind of latitude, but if somebody, we're, if the market is at the point right now that if somebody coughs up about $5 million, this stuff is going to become a reality overnight. That's all it is, it's a matter of about $5 million bucks and about 12 months build time. This stuff is right at the point of convergence, and somebody's going to do it. Sooner than later, and there's all, and there are people quietly talking about this stuff, but all the pieces are there. I mean, this, this is huge. The implications of that page, being able to quantify the transactional behaviors on a page, is absolutely huge. This is cool for an instructional designer to look at. Being able to do this with learning content is big because it turns it into a number. It turns it into a value that can then be transposed against these. Those two pieces converging are a big, big deal. And that is where we're at in terms of where the analytics are at and on being able to provision. Like I said, it's already had kind of cost in the commercial industries. And here's the example. Uh, recommending downloads using an Amazon style uh, resource for OERs. Here's a, here's a screenshot actually of a prototype dashboard we've got. So this, it looks like bookshelf manner. I have a question because I have a problem with Amazon. Is, is, is it possible for you to give the information with the books available or not? textbook that I had for my classes that I put myself, and Amazon didn't restock it for six weeks. So it was impossible for students to get it from Amazon. If I could have that information and have it posted on their website, you can't get it from Amazon, you've got to get it from another source. It would be very useful. <clears throat> as far as I can tell, there is no way to do that. I just had the leader of Amazon as a source because they didn't stock books. That's an interesting question. Do you, do you have to go through a pub? Is it something where you have to go through a publisher for that book? Well, yeah, they have to go yeah. to the publisher, the person who published it. And both the publisher and I made lots of appeals to Amazon to get stock. But particularly in the first two weeks of classes, there were none, except they were a couple for twice the retail price. Um, and so it would meant it was useless as a resource for me for uh, for getting them the textbook. I honestly don't know the answer to that question. I, I've never seen anything that does that, which looks at stock availability. I mean, I could, I wouldn't imagine it'd be too horribly difficult to build an app to do that if you had the APIs for bookstores. Well, they tell you all the time this item is unavailable and we'll ship in mm -hmm. three to four weeks if you but, go to order you know, a pair of shoes or something. So it seems like the technology is there. They just don't want someone start going leveraging. Right. to another MSN, you know, to Barnes and Noble or something. Yeah. Anyway, this I just wanted to raise that question. The other one that I was wondering whether your database includes, because I teach several relatively large online classes, and between about a third of the people in the class, a country of origin other than of the United States. And about 20% first first language other than English. So, and then the cultures behind those things are very different. Oh, yes. So it means that teaching the students from lots of different origins have very different patterns of learning and ability to grasp and all kinds of stuff. 
Have we anybody looked at the the question about what about these different languages and what kind of success rate do people have? Um, I, for instance, I ran into three that I never heard of that come from Eastern Europe uh, languages. But in any case, I wonder if anybody's looked at the national origin of people and success rates and how you teach better for people from different cultures. I certainly get very different behavior from the students, which I have to always adjust to because some cultures are very polite, some of them are rude, and go back and forth. So you just adjust to that. But Success rates, yes. I know that those have been looked at. And because there are, uh, there's been several projects, and our Stanford has looked very closely at that, and I can't think of who. But there's someone at Stanford who's done that. Um, just internally, most universities with a large online presence, if they have a lot of foreign students in their programs, will take a look at the country of origin. Um, West Virginia University actually has a study through their graduate office on looking at persistence and progression of international students. And I know that, I um, can't think of his name, but Mike Wilhelm, who works in that office, if you reach out to Michael Wilhelm, he might be able to help you get some, because I know that they studied that a little bit. Now, how that goes with impacting teaching and learning, I honestly don't know, because that's, that's not the kind of data that I really get into. I don't get down to the, I don't get down to the course level, because most of what I do is out there in the big, wide swath area, and getting down to where it takes more fine grain analysis. Um, that's just not what, I, what I've done right. I know that the stuff's been done on large empirical scales on the first part, but the second, I would have to imagine somebody, like in a college of education, has tackled that somewhere, but I just have no idea where on the, on the differences in pedagogy. I, you know, some of the work in, some of the work in andragogy, maybe, there might be some andragogy studies on that with respect to adults, but I, I, that's just pure supposition. So we have a few questions on the, uh, on the web. Uh, one of them, I believe, is, is uh, what you see as the, uh, as the timeline for the next few major breakthroughs in learning. Uh, for example, you see the ability to crawl and categorize uh, all open educational resources and link them to learning needs. Uh, with $5 million in 12 months, what else do you predict as coming up? Yeah, it, it's a function of, it's not just a function of time, as Kyle points out, it's a function of time and money. Uh, because none of this stuff is free. And there are very few institutions, if any, who have all the technical people in the back office that they need to make this stuff work. We certainly don't. Um, you know, so, you know, I think that matching up the content using a combination of semantics, web analytics is next, which is a precursor to true adaptive learning. Um, I think that within the, I think within the next 24 months, we're going to see somewhere in there, see our first big breakthroughs in true adaptive systems. I think that's coming. Um, a more ubiquitous use of latent semantics, because our project here, I'll show you just one example. There's a couple of universities in England dealing with this. Some incredible work coming out of Romania on this. Uh, the Romanian universities, when it comes to information and data science, are absolutely awesome. Um, the other things I see. Uh, with respect to data is perhaps we'll see somebody be able to form the first associational patterns between institutions, maybe. If it's going to happen, it'll happen within the next couple of years. And what I mean by that is, yeah, I was involved with PAR from the outset. I said earlier, I'm, I'm on the board of directors. Uh, for Civitas, et cetera. But here's the thing we saw in PAR. And we see in other places, Civitas will tell you this too. There are no universal truths across the schools 
for the most part, aside of little things. When you start trying to predict retention, the models are so different between each school that trying to reuse one a, a model from school A on school B is pretty fruitless. And as many variables as we try to capture, I think we're going to capture a lot more when we start looking at web analytics and transactional data. But the big variables out there that nobody wants to talk about that I think actually makes this much difference is institutional culture. And that's the latent variable that is not measurable that's going to keep us at a point where we have to um, look at each school as an independent entity. Because you can't find multicollinearity in something that's that subjective. That said, we're starting to see more and more large commercial efforts as well as academic efforts to federate data. So within two years, if there are universal truths, somebody's going to start um, start seeing some of them. It'll either be you'll see something like in cluster analyses, potentially multi-dimensional scaling is another way that some people are looking at it potentially. Uh, machine vectors, I don't think so there's people toying around with that that I think are just asking for way more trouble because those models break really easy. Um, but for our universal truths out there, I think we're going to see those coming. The other thing that's out there is um, to make all this stuff work, we're going to crush the level of platforms we're working at now. Um, the platforms that are out there that this stuff is being delivered on were never meant to do what they're doing now, let alone um, supporting uh, the higher end applications like these web analytics. Um, and that's why, actually, it's kind of, I got started talking to y'all outside of knowing a few people here originally. I got started talking to y'all because of the work we're doing on platform, not analytics. That um, we're thinking about how to restructure the entire LMS into something wildly different, um, which is what's underneath this. So that's needed to make it work. Uh, we also had a, a question from uh, Josh Wenmore. I'm uh, sure that the newly archived resources are actually valuable rather than simply relevant. What will the action? Seriously. That's what we have to do. We got to the point now where the, the data that's, that is, is apparent and has an apparent value um, and relevance, we know what it is. So constantly, we'll find a data point that may or may not mean something and see how it works. And if it doesn't work, you throw it out. But we throw it out of that run. You keep everything. And it even goes further than saying, here's what a variable was, because if you set some of these systems up to run overnight, um, you can create a lot of abstracted variables, too. Like, for instance, whenever we have these models running, uh, using another technique called ensemble theory, which allows you to compare various models to see if it's a neural net one night or you know, if it might be a random forest the next night or whatever is predicted as the best fit. Then we also do all these abstracted variables where it'll create ratios between every single variable and every other variable. It'll basically exhaust, you know, hundreds of thousands of combinations to see if any variables matter in that. It's kind of like iterative chat analysis in uh, decision trees. So you don't actually throw the stuff out, you keep it because someday it may become valuable. Because as you intervene, once you create a if you had a model. Like we had with the neural nets, it could tell you with a 90% degree, 92% degree of accuracy, who was going to drop out in the next five days. You start intervening to help those students, and pretty soon after you start intervening, the model that you just built is no longer relevant. So you've got another model that has to take its place, and the new model that takes its place, one of those variables that wasn't important at first may be now, because you may have solved one problem but created an entirely different one or caused something entirely different to surface. So just buy a lot of storage. And we archive at APUS, we archive 
just as an FYI, we were talking about data. And again, this is small data in comparison. We archive about a terabyte a night. But that's infinitesimal beside the radio astronomy folks. Yes. Right. You, were, you were talking about big data become nano for some of them. Um, what do you think about if we want to do, say, course analysis, and, but we don't have enough data points on that, no matter how much we collect. And cross courses, there are so different factors they may actually call for different models. So for each model, we, we simply don't have enough data. How do you, from your experience, how would you address that? Well, this is kind of ugly, but this is what I've done in the past. Whenever I've needed to build it out for a specific subgroup and not had enough data, I just, boot, I just do a bootstrap in a Monte Carlo simulation, use Monte Carlo data to blow it out with. But student's behavior, you just randomly give it? Well, not randomly, but you use the general patterns that exist in the small I sample see. to blow the Monte Carlo out. I see. Yeah. And believe it or not, when in, in some of those that we did years ago, with like real small courses or real small majors that didn't have um, enough, a large enough in at the time, and we run a Monte Carlo on and blow up by a factor of 500 or something. At the time, we thought this is probably what it's going to look like, and we've kept that data over time. And now you look at it, it's pretty good. Pretty good. It's not, it's not perfect, but Monte Carlos are very powerful. All right. Thank you. So you mentioned your retention models. You gave the example of retention models uh, five days in advance. Uh, the question from the other room, maybe Kyle or one of the uh, individuals in the room, why do you measure five days ahead? Uh, is it enough time to potentially retain a student? Uh, they thought perhaps a, a month ahead would be uh, more accurate and more usable. Uh, no, because whenever it's, it seems like whenever students, and the reason we because that's the lowest number of days we can get and still have some degree of accuracy in the models. They start to blow up inside of five days. Which makes sense because five days pretty much represents a week in the life of the student. So usually there's some event that happens inside that week that causes them to lose, to become disenchanted with the course. A month out is, you're lost. yeah, you'll lose the student. I mean, if they get behind by a matter of days, especially in our courses because they're eight weeks long. And if, you're, if you get behind more than a few days, or if you don't intervene with them in a matter of days, they're done. And it's like, it's like running a summer course. I mean, you need to know the next day in a summer course if you're running. But if you could know a month out, the, the flip side of that is if you could know a month out who was going to be at risk, that has an advantage because you could intervene way, way early. Now, that said, we do know Almost an admission that there are certain student profiles that are there are certain profiles that are not for the student at risk on day one. So we start with they get flagged inside the system and they get special advising services and things like that because especially like low SES students of certain uh, zip codes and so forth, you know that they're going to have problems right off. So you flag them. But it's just a, it's, it's the optimal amount of time, in our opinion. Uh, Larry uh, from from uh, his office asked, uh, do you see the government or another body stepping in and halting the exploration, uh, collection, and use of the data within education? Actually, I'm hoping they step in, Larry. I'd like to work with the NSA on this a little bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> no, uh, serious question. A uh, serious answer to that is if it. Um, there may be some efforts to legislate some of this because people feel very sensitive about their data when they stop and think about it. But, you know, what we're talking about collecting for learning outcomes, and I, and I was actually asked this I asked a question very similar to this over lunch today, is if you went on to a website and all the content for that website was stored in the server, but as you went on, your page was randomly generated from the contents of that server and just thrown up there, or if you went from 
a site that knew who you were and could give you what you want to where you could shop efficiently and get what you want and out of there and you were happy with what you purchased, which one would you rather shop at? But to do the second, they need to have information about you. So it comes down to, I think it's almost the haves and have -nots. I think it, not, it's not exactly the haves and have-nots, but it's, it's going, I think we're looking more of a future among students with the opt-ins and the opt-outs. May I? Yes. <laughs> that was his answer to the question I posed about the ethics behind it, which is why it sort of gets into here. But I want to take it another step now after having seen your presentation. And they ask you, and this has to do with the managed content, okay? Um, and that really robust possibility of using semantic analytics to present to students information that they might not have might not have access to without these tools. How will faculty respond to a kind of unmanaged um, curricular adaptation or adjustment um, or intervention? Well, so we have. <laughs> yeah, we're really worried about the federal government, and I'm worried about how will the faculty respond to this kind of adaptive learning. When they're not driving the machine, therein lies the problem. Um, there, um, I think we are looking at somewhat of, uh, for some faculty, a slightly dystopian future. <laughs> for some, we're looking at a very bright future. Um, in the early 90s, Drucker wrote about the changes he saw coming in education. And he wrote about the rise of the superstar faculty. And he never saw the web coming at that time, because it was still bulletin board services. But he predicted a time when courses at universities would largely be taught by those who had the best rapport with their students who were the most vibrant, who could get their point across the best. And they would be then, those students would then be engaged and individually tutored by the ones who were less dynamic, shall we say, but provided a support role to students. And if you take that analogy to what we're looking at with content, it's going to be who develops the best content will be the one, the type of content that a university within a department, if you have a faculty member who is by far and away the most personable and you need videos shot, it makes sense to go to that person. If you have another asset where it's writing based or, you know, written, then it makes sense to go to the faculty member who does that and aggregate the assets from the people who are most apt to. Now, interestingly, there's a few big universities in this country who have not revealed what they're doing yet, but I have consulting agreements with them, and I won't say who they were, but who are actually paying royalties on each of those pieces of content that's being built back to the professor for use in the university courses. Um, Open University does their courses with six faculty members altogether, so six offers yep. to get a room, and that's how they curate that kind of same type of thing. And we're going to see it coming. And then the others will be the ones who moderate discussion boards and great papers. But you're, t you're talking about something different than the content. My understanding is you're talking about something different than the content development that is set in them. You're talking about adaptive on the fly content development, which is a, a very different thing. What's the content developed and done? It, it will need iterated on over the over time and improvements made to it. But, it, but when that content is built, it becomes just another object to it. It says if you have a student who needs to learn this and falls into this, this, and this parameter, then we reach up on the shelf, so to speak, into the um, into the CMS or digital asset management layer system 
and we grab um, video 2.372B and plug it into the course for the student at that point, and it's done on the fly. And at that point, Professor Smith, who created that asset, then gets a royalty payment for it off the of usage. That's sweet. Um, does this term take into account? And I don't, I don't know if this expression is still in vogue or not. The learning styles. Yeah, we prefer not to use that term. I yeah. don't I, I, I use that term anymore. Um, does it take into account that some students don't learn best by using videos? Yeah, we yes, it does. I'm just saying. That what that would say is it, it looks at it looks at students modal preference and optimal media fit. Oh, that's um, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the way you would classify that. But yes, it looks at those things and it would say, ah, we have a unit on the causes of the First World War. So here is a video where Professor Smith explains the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand. Let's pull it over and stick it in. Here we have a voiceover Captivate file with graphics of Bosnia Herzegovina and locating where Ferdinand was from, which interacts more with Timmy's personality than Susie's, who got the video. So we plug it in. And so it works on that kind of fit using the media mix, the content, and the student's individual demographic characteristics. So we have uh, time for one or two more questions. Uh, one of the uh, questions came out of the other room. Uh, given what you know about the use of computer-based semantic analysis, how long do you think it'll be before computers can understand and provide effective feedback on essays or, or text-based student responses? Can do it or can do it at scale? That's a whole other matter. Can do it. If the technology is already there, because I don't know if you if any of you saw this, but I, IBM actually has a computer now that can construct arguments, which is no small thing. Um, and they had the it was fact based. Now they have one that can construct arguments, and that's really cool. Except it can't do it for every single class. Um, I think that given where the technology is at now, knowing that it exists, uh, given Moore's Law, what would we be at? Uh, somewhere between 36 and 54 months. That'd be a good guess, two to three cycles of Moore's Law. Three, given what IBM's been on that. Probably three cycles, 54 months out. More questions from the room? Yeah, so, and, and I'm guessing this is probably why you're thinking about the learning ecosystem or platform a lot now and re envisioning that. So technologies have this tendency to diverge, right? Especially learning management systems as they are today. Yeah. You know, I'm about to say it's terrible. And we try and get into other environments, right? So some more creative, interesting environments that do one thing really well that does not sit under that umbrella. So that makes analytics really hard because there's data coming, there's data, you know, if I teach English and Brad teaches English and I'm using Piazza and Brad's using, I don't know, you know, whatever Brad wants to use, it's very different, right? We have the same learning objectives, we're going after the same things, but we're doing it in a very different way. And I'm channeling some of the, <coughs> the opponents of analytics that I've talked to recently that by looking at these kind of convergent models, the majority of the English faculty are using these things, and our data takes these things into account, those faculty on the fringe might be pushed to implement things that fall under the umbrella versus be exploratory versus try new things that might be more effective. So how do you, how do you account for the convergence that goes on with faculty freedoms, faculty trying new things that might be more effective, uh, in the analytics behind things. Uh, in 
in some cases, faculty need to be converged. Um, uh, I don't know if they're going to like to <laughs> No, and I'll give, you an, I'll give you an example. I remember whenever I was in, in, in my doctoral program, I had a professor who would have his secretary print him out every email that came in and put it on his desk because he refused to open a computer to look at a keyboard and look at a monitor. He needed a little bit of convergence. I'm sure. Okay. Um, I think that at a certain point, if you aren't caught up, even if you aren't trying to catch up with the technology, you don't have to be a technology maven as a faculty member. That's not your job. The technology should be seamless. But if you are just completely resistant, that's why I said perhaps you need converged a little bit. Because I know people who will not, in faculty of certain institutions, who refuse to use anything. And, you know, to this day, that even re, even is remotely involved with the uniform structure. I think, though, that the good that the those people on that side of the coin, you know, this is why I stick to IOA. And I don't care what happens to them. I really don't. Um, the others, though, on the other side of it, I don't think that's a real fear because the ones who are on the fringe and who want to try to play with stuff. There's always going to be somebody looking for the next thing out there. And there's always going to be somebody who needs to see if this will work to do research around. And there's always going to be foundations and corporations who will sponsor that kind of research among faculty so they can have a piece of the next coming thing. So there's always going to be somebody there if they know how to hunt them down. And it's up to, you know, it's up to the different uh, I think even there's a name for that for the office in the university that helps with grants and uh, yeah, grants and development. Yeah, the grants and development. There's always offices like that. They're the ones who need to reach out to their fringe faculty because they don't need to be converted mm -hmm. at all. They need to be encouraged to innovate and do wild, wacky things that either succeed or they go down in flames. One of the two. But going down in flames is cool. I've done it many times. Um, <laughs> I can show you how not to spend a million dollars, I can tell you that, on back end infrastructure. Um, I can give you the playbook for that one. Um, so, uh, you know, but you need people to do that because you need to know what doesn't work, too. So, you know, you need to know what works, but, but it's, it's like, seriously, I said I do a lot of consulting, a lot of consulting, as a matter of fact, and um, wherever somebody hires me, the first thing I tell them is, look, you're not paying me to tell you what to do. You're basically paying me to tell you what not to do. Uh, is what it comes down to, because you're paying for all the mistakes that I've made in the past on stuff. But people need to make those mistakes, and you need to have the relationship with those grants and development officers to help explore. That's my answer to that. Yeah, it seems like some faculty that are out there on that fringe might even want to opt out of having analytics run on their course. It's going to look yeah. so different. You know, the data coming out of that course will look so different from other. Uh, I'd still want to run it. Though. I mean, yeah, but yeah. not, not yeah. use it in the stack, but it'd be just really right. cool to see what the data was looking like coming out of it. Oh, yeah. yeah absolutely. But don't use it in the aggregation with the others. But yeah, I mean, like throw it into a random forest analysis with the other data and see if there's, you know, some different, uh, you know, some different markers coming forward in it or something like that. There's papers in like MDS patterns floating out of it, that kind of thing, relative to the other data. Okay. So I think we have time for about one more question. Is there any? Yeah. So have you learned more about um, students who are going to be successful or not? Have you noticed that the, and there's a long uh, pattern of, of people looking at students and saying, this student's good to be an engineering student, this student should be a different type of have you noticed, uh, have you seen anything where that would show you that maybe students should not choose a particular path and that there's been actually use for data to advise them not to go that way? Uh, I'm just curious what you've seen in that way in terms of student path selection. Yeah, you can see it. Uh, we use a technique um, that's fairly common, hidden Markov analysis. Um, that you, if you take all the curricular paths that all students in a, in a population have taken over time, You'll find certain courses in there <clears throat> that are really pivotal, pivotal, that you'll see if a student 
earn by AB <coughs> or better in differential equations, for instance, then they are probably going to be fairly successful as like a chemical engineer. Whereas if they got a C or less than that, then you know there's only a small majority who made it through their next couple courses, let alone on to the full chemistry course. And then you know it could be something like that. Pivotal courses early on show up all the time in hidden Markov. And running that to tell a student when they have a very low probability of succeeding, I think you're actually doing great service to the student ahead of time. Now, yeah, granted, you can call them in as an advisor. You know, and of course, they'll so, say, so, you know, I had pneumonia for three weeks during the semester, and then my grandmother died. Well, okay. Yeah, you had a really bad semester. So maybe this doesn't apply to you, but if you were just hung over and it was your dog, not your grandmother that died, you probably really need to think about whether this career path is right for you, given the fact that there's a 97% chance you're not going to make it. And so given the, the, the you know, potential for personalized learning, you see the point where they'll say, okay, if we're not sure you can make it easily, it may take you a longer amount of time, or may provide us a resource and make it cost you more money. That's a trend. Oh, absolutely. Inflection point detection and using that for programmatic advising, that's coming. Civitas is actually has an app that does it very well, which I help with. Uh, but yeah, using some of the stuff we just talked about. They do a very good job with this. There's a couple other companies out there that are playing with this and uh, but, but, but. Maricopa. Um, community, not Maricopa. Northern Arizona. Actually, does a good job with this. So. All right, well, thank you for providing this talk today and his expertise.